the answers to the 2017 preliminary examination. So first of all, the first question we have one, why, what's the main reason we use PVC for electrical cables? The answer we went with was B, durability and insulation. Anyone got any problem with that? No? Okay. I think that one's pretty self-explanatory. They're all like, that's a, the, there's some answers there that could be confusing, but insulation is the key word that helps me to answer that one there. Okay, question two. Which of these are all vector quantities? Well, straight away, if I just look at mass, I know that mass is not a vector. Right, mass is a scalar, so B and C are out. Distance is not a vector, so D is out. So it just leaves A. I don't even have to look at the rest of it. Right? What is the Young's modulus a measure of? The stiffness of the material. We could quickly say, what is B? What is the definition of B? Resistance to indentation is? Hardness. Hardness is scratching and indentation. Uh, percentage plastic deformation, eh, don't worry. Um, the degree of necking, eh, don't worry. Okay. What are the properties of steel? What are the properties of steel does cold rolling improve? Now, if we have hot rolling, the problem with hot rolling is that so hot rolling we it kind of like is like annealing and rolling at the same time. We have large grains that are unstressed grains, but the what are the problems of hot rolling? What's the downside of hot rolling? It's not dimensionally accurate. Also, it has scaling, right, which we need to finish, a, fi a surface finish that we have to, to, to fix. So cold rolling, not only does it give us strength because it gives us elo elongated grains, right, which usually we will normalize because we don't really like elongated grains, but it's give it does give us additional strength, especially if we normalize. It gives us dimensional accuracy, which hot rolling doesn't, and it gives us a good finish. It doesn't give us that scaling. Okay. So if we have the stress in a brake cable that has a diameter of two millimeters and a force of 200 newtons. So what's the formula? Okay, force over cross-sectional area. So that's stress equals force over area. So we have to find our area. Our, we're not given an area, we're given a diameter. So what's our area gonna be? Normally, I like to use pi d squared on 4, but in this particular case, I'm going to say if we use pi r squared, right, what's our radius? One millimeter. Okay, so one, milli one millimeter squared is? One. Okay, times pi is? 3.14. Okay, and then we're going to have force over area. So if I have force, okay, before we, fit, before we type that into the calculator, we have to think about units. We're using, using millimeters squared. Now, under normal circumstances, we always use SI units. That means meters, that means newtons, that means joules, that means watts. But there's one, one exception that we can look at, which is the grease units. The grease units are, one, we go together like megapascals and millimeters squared. My year 12s like to say millimeters squared and megapascals. I don't like that one as much. Yep. Great. So we want to use millimeters and we want to use megapascals. So we're using the right units. So we've got 200 divided by 3.14 equals 63.7. And it's going to be in megapascals because we're using grease units. Okay. Question six. This is one that I marked everyone wrong because I was using the wrong marking guideline. That's why it's a different color. So if you, got, if you gave the answer B, you need to let me know. Not now, but at the end of this lesson, let me know. Now, what is the weight of that lawnmower? What? 400 newtons. I was all ready to do the bump bomb when someone guessed that wrong. Right? It's not 40 kilograms. It's 400 newtons. Right? 40 kilograms is the mass. Okay. So... We always know that the weight is the hypotenuse of the triangle, right? So that means that our normal reaction has to be less than 400, mega, 400 kilonewtons. Sorry, has to be less than 400 newtons. Which of those answers is less than 400 newtons? It has to be newtons. So the only answer there could be, oh, okay, it could be 100, but that's ridiculous. The answer there is, I'm going to say it's D without even looking. What is the correct way of doing it? Where the normal, is it the adjacent or is it the opposite side of the triangle? It's adjacent. So if we're using adjacent, it's cos. 
So it's going to be 400 cos 15. 400 cos 15 is 386.3. We okay with that? We will maybe draw that up on the board if we go through it again. Okay. Question seven. This is a tough question. I should also point out, I went through um, through this with a friend of mine. Like As I was marking, a friend of mine was looking at him like, what are you doing? And I said, oh, you want to go through it? And so he tried answering it without having any knowledge of, of engineering whatsoever. Right? And he got eight out of 20. Right? So when I got through some of these stu some students' results and they were like, okay, my lowest is six. The six is the number to beat. And he got eight out of 20 just by guessing. Um, this one here was one we were talking about. It's like, oh, man, you know, there's several answers that are correct. I'm like, yes, but there's one that's most correct. And that's quite reasonable. HSC will often do this, which is most correct. Okay. I would say they don't rust and they don't deteriorate. That's true. Well, to a degree. They don't rust, but does stone deteriorate? Yeah. A little bit. A little bit. Almost so much that it doesn't in really human time frames. Not really. It does if you have like, you know, very, very high pollution, but it's not the best answer, right? So the best answer is that they're plentiful, they're durable. Durable covers that dot point anyway. Yeah, when we're talking about rust and uh, rust and deterioration, that's durability anyway. So straight away, the A is already a better answer. Okay, they don't have a high tensile strength. They have terrible tensile strength. They have good compressive strength. Okay, aesthetically pleasing, it's not a reason that we want to give typically in engineering. Okay, this one here is a hard question. My friend's like, man, I don't know what any of these words mean. It's like, yeah, it's a hard question anyway. Okay. If we took B out of the equation, which one is the softest material? If we just took out austenite, which one's the softest material? Ferrite. Ferrite's pretty soft. Perlite is a little bit harder, and cementite is harder still. But austenite, what temperature does austenite exist at? Like 900 degrees, a little bit less. It's like 800, 780, something like that. But if you're going up to 900 degrees, that metal's going to be pretty soft. Yeah? So I think it's a tough question. It does require you to really understand what austenite is. Austenite only exists at high temperature. If you have any steel that's 700 degrees, 700 degrees Celsius, it's going to be pretty soft, right? We can agree with that. Yeah, okay, so the answer is B, right? It is the softest. Okay, now this question again, I thought, well, this one's really going to be testing, the, uh, testing those kids, right? This is a harder question. We have done this question. We did talk about it. But what we need to do is we need to think about the vertical component of that 40 kilonewtons, right? What is the vert vertical component of 40, 40 kilonewtons? Okay, is it going to be the adjacent or is it going to be the opposite side of the triangle? Well, in the case of 45 degrees, it actually doesn't matter, right? But we're going to use, yeah, but we're going to use cos. So cos 40... I know from just in my head is point, point 0.707, right? I just know that. Someone check it to prove me wrong, right? I'm, I'm being recorded here. It would be embarrassing if I'm wrong. But I know in my head that cos 45 is point 0.707, right? So point 0.707 times 40 <coughs> times 1,300. That's, this is how I did it, right? Point 0.707 times 40 times 1,300, right? That's the moment on one side. Right, force times distance, cos seven, uh, cos forty five times seven uh, times forty times thirteen hundred, divided by the other side. The moment on the other side is six hundred times f. So if we divide by six hundred, we're going to get sixty one point two seven. Right? What was it? It was seven oh seven. Good, it's checked. Okay. So the correct answer there is C. Okay. Same thing. Now this is a hard question. Right. When we're doing our, um, it's the same question, but the difference is when we're talking about velocity ratios, what we're talking about is distances. Yeah? Velocity ratios are the maximum possible mechanical advantage, whereas mechanical advantage is what we actually get in reality. Yeah? And the difference between those two numbers is how we figure out efficiency. Yeah? The maximum, the, the, what we got divided by the maximum possible was our efficiency. Okay, so what we're going to have is a number smaller than 1, right? So it's going to be 600. We could go, if it was a vertical force, it would be 600 divided by 1300, right? Six, 
if it was a vertical force, it would be 600 divided by 1300, which would be 0 .4, 0 0.46. That number's not there. It's not a choice. Right? It's not a choice. So that means our 1300, what we have to use is we have to use the diagonal perpendicular distance. Now, I did say I didn't want to draw too much stuff on the board while I'm recording. And I don't, don't have a marker, which is encouraging me to not do that. This is all audio that I'm going to have to delete. Okay, but I feel it's worthwhile to actually, I should have included this on the drawing. What we're talking about is this distance here, the perpendicular distance. Don't be fooled. So if this is 1300, what's that? Which side of the triangle is it going to be? Is it the adjacent or is it the opposite? Adjacent. So adjacent is cos. So it's going to be 1300 cos 45. I happen to know in my head what cos 45 degrees is. Does anyone else know? 0 0.707. I just happen to know that in my head, right? So if I take my that distance, 1300 times 0 0.707, that's 919, right? You guys remember 919? My answer is going to be 600 divided by 919 equals 65.2 D. You get it? Let's keep going. Okay, this one super easy. I didn't even need to stop to blink on this one, right? This one you should just be able to get. We have talked enough about the disco number. If it's something that's at 60 degrees, 60, 30 triangles, if we know that this is one, if we know that the hypotenuse is one, the small side is what percentage? 50%, right? It's half the size. What is the other side? The disco number, right? My friend Disco, who was born in 1986. The disco number. 86.6%. So, in this case, we have a force of 100. What is the horizontal component going to be? 50, right? Because it's half. What's the vertical component going to be? 86.6. The disco number, right? So, we have no other combinations. Oh, okay. Is it A or is it C? Well, Fy is vertical, right? So Fy is 86.6. So that's where there's a little bit of a trick. Is it A or is it C? We have to look at Fy is vertical. Yep. Knowing the disco number, knowing that cos 45 is, seven, uh, um, is 0 0.707, tell you what, it makes your life easier, right? It makes things faster. It helps you in maths too. Maths as well. Okay, thermosoftening plastics and thermosetting polymers are different. Which statement describes the difference in thermosetting polymers? What's the difference between a thermosetting polymer? Why don't thermosetting setting polymers, why don't they soften when they heat, get heated up? Cross-linking covalent bonds, right? Yeah, cross-links between the chains. So, the question is then, is it in 2D or is it in 3D? Look, I'll be honest, the question asking if it's in 2D or 3D, that's, a, that's not something we talk about a lot, right? It doesn't get a lot of, air, lot of air time. But I think it's reasonable that even if you just knew that it was cross-linking, you're thinking that those structures are going to be in 3D structures, not 2D structures. There's very few things that are in 2D structures. Graphite is a 2D structure, but pretty much everything else is going to be a 3D molecular, molecular stru structure. <coughs> okay, 13. Again, another one that I think is a little bit tricky. Remember I talked about how independent papers are a little bit tougher than what you'll get in the HSC level, right? The reason is that these smart schools, the rich kids, they want to test them a little bit. They want to give them slightly harder exams so that, that way they work harder. Like, oh man, I only got 60. I need to be getting 75. So they work a little bit harder. Or realistically, these, these rich kids are like, oh man, I only got 85. I need to get over 90. Or otherwise, you know, we won't go down that, that path. But the point is that they're a little bit harder, right? So, yeah? Did you say that just percentages or D? Percentages, it can only be A or D, yeah, because it's unitless. Percentages are just a number, right? So as I've written here, 
stress, it, it, stress is unitless, right? Percentages are just a number. They're not a unit. Yes, so it has to be either A or D, yeah? Correct. Let's go through it. Let's figure out how. Right? Let's have a look. I can see that look, Sergey, but uh, uh, let's have a look. Okay. Okay. It's a good, good, you're raising a good point, right? And so I'm glad that you, you've addressed it. Strain is unitless. Okay, so strain, which is written as epsilon, right? That, that funny little E, right, is the change in length over length. Right, what we usually write is E over L, right? Because we very rarely do compress. Now, as it happens, there have been HSE questions where they do compress and oh, mind blown. But that's why I always like to write delta L over L zero. I was too lazy to write the zero when I was drawing this on, um, on you know, uh, preview, so I didn't bother. E over L, what was our extension? What was our extension? Our extension was two millimeters. What was our original length? One meter. Now, we never want to mix up units. We always use base units with the exception of two units we're allowed to use. Millimeters and megapascals, right? I'm not gonna sing the song again, but millimeters, millimeters and megapascals. So I suggest to you convert everything to millimeters. So what I've got is two millimeters divided by a thousand millimeters equals 0 0.002, and 0 0.002 as a percentage, so multiply, you know, times it by a hundred and put a percentage sign on it, is 0.2. You got it? Yeah. You'll never make that mistake again, right? That's where you can be happy, right? That, you know, I can see that dirty look, but this is year eleven. You can't make this mistake again, right? Whereas you'll never make that mistake again. Now you'll know it, and it'll be in there forever. No, sometimes sometimes the number, the strain can be really high. The strain could be 0.2, but it's often very low. Yeah, often strain is very low. Okay, depends on how stiff the material is. Okay. Um, this is, again, a little bit of a head scratcher, right? Question 14. Alloys don't actually make more grain, grain bound. Right. What they do is they make it harder to move those dislocations. Grain boundaries also do that. So when we cold work something, when we hit it with a hammer or we bend it back and forth, we create more grain boundaries. Grain, grain boundaries and these odd shaped atoms in your lattice, both of those make it hard to move grain uh, make, move dislocations. Yeah. Two things make it hard to move dislocations. If we have an our atom lattice. If we have our lattice of, of metal atoms and we want to try and move around dislocations, there's two things that stop that. Grain boundaries and alloyed metals, right? So that's what we're looking for here, right? The, the, uh, they, offer less re they don't offer less resistance. They offer greater resistance to the movement, right? So it has to be D. Okay, question 15. V equals IR. Right, I like to draw the little triangle, that works for me, but in this case, V equals IR is the easy version of it. What's our I? 15. What's our R? 16. Right, 15 times 16, 240. The only thing I should say that you should be aware of is there are milliamps and there are microamps, right? But in this case, they're using the base units. It make, makes life pretty easy, right? 240 volts. 240 volts, it even sounds right because that's the, the voltage of, of electricity in Australia. Huh, I didn't mark this one as correct. Okay, this question, this question is a go-to question in engineering studies. It is in so many past papers that it is ridiculous, right? It is there just over and over and over again. Now, we've talked about this when we've talked about drawing, but this is the first time we've seen it up on, on paper, right? This is the last time where the marks don't really count, and I wanted to really make sure I got my chance to put it in an exam before it actually starts to count. Because I know that I could say this a hundred times in the classroom and you will not learn it, but this question, it's just one of the ones you need to learn. If you do physics, you need to know the definition of voltage. It's just in so many past papers. This question is in just in so many past papers. So Harry, you're sleeping. I just wanna say this is one you wanna pay attention to, right? Yeah, this is the one that you want to take out their headphones and actually pay attention to. Okay. 
The advantage of CAD isn't that it's faster. It's not cheaper, but what it is easier to do is it's easier to store more information, it's easier to send that information, and it's easier to modify. Based on what I've just said, which answer is correct? B. Right? It's accurate, it's editable, it's able to store. We can integrate with the other information. Okay, so where it says CAM, CAM is computer-aided uh, manufacture. So that's where you can plug it into your 3D printer or your laser cutter. Or the other way also works, right? So those of you who might be interested in surveying, surveying, a great job, plenty of job, job prospects, especially if you like going out in the bush, especially if you like working on your own, right? surveying what you have is these machines called total stations you walk around you hold your stick and the machine just records all the information you get home you plug it in and it just puts it all into the drawing for you it's fantastic all this information stored electronically right so that, that way you didn't even know you wanted that information but then six years down the track someone comes along and says hey uh, we're thinking about putting a new water pipe in here how deep is the ground and you say oh I don't know Let's have a look at the drawing because the, the total station recorded it and all that information is stored on a layer that nobody ever looks at until you need it. Right? True story. This really happened. Right? Okay, 17. Another question everyone got wrong because I marked the wrong thing. Okay, before we start, before we start, windshields are at the front. They're not windows. What are windshields, right? Windscreens, what are they made out of? Laminated glass, right? The same thing you put in the shop window so that someone gets a sledgehammer, you know, someone's angry with you, you did something wrong, you know, you took their girlfriend, they come along with a sledgehammer and they smash your windscreen. It doesn't shatter, it just leaves these great big marks and it gets dented. Right? If they do the same thing with your windscreen with your with your sorry, your your windows, they come along with a, a sledgehammer, smash into a thousand tiny little safe pieces, right? What do we call it when something smashes into a thousand little tiny safe pieces? Puff and glass, right? Okay. Which one has the highest coefficient of friction? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, again, if you got that one wrong, come and see me. Sorry, if you got that one correct, I haven't given you a mark for it. You need to come and see me. You need to see me soon. Okay. 18. Which one's the correct answer? Which one has the highest coefficient of friction? Rubber and rubber is the highest. Which one's going to be higher? Dry rubber or wet rubber? Dry. Dry rubber. Now, again, I know in the textbook it talks about rubber on rubber. It doesn't talk about wet or dry rubber. Harry, you were asleep. You weren't paying attention. Which one do you think is going to, have a, going to be stickier? If I had two dry rubbers or two wet rubbers, which one do you think is going to slide more easily? Wet rubber is going to slide more easily. So the higher the coefficient of friction, the harder it is to slide. So which one's going to have the highest coefficient of friction? Excellent. Well done. Okay. Question 19. Right. I made a point of saying this because by this stage I'd already seen the exam and I knew, knew to make sure when you talked about biomedical engineering. Right. Why is stainless steel, uh, why is it a good choice? Why is it a good choice to resist corrosion? Chromium, that's it, high chromium. Chromium makes uh, a passive surface oxide film. Bam, B. Okay, question 20. This is one of the ones my friend got right. He's like, ooh, lots of good answers. But it's always going to be, does uh, this is the only one my wife got right when she did it, right? She's like, has to be design, right? Like, it's the only one, look, she's less confident about giving wrong answers, right? But she's like, that's the only one that she knew for sure was right. She says, it has to be design, right? So, now... Again, it's a good question, especially those of you who do DT. This is a question you see in design technology as well. Okay, so we're through the, um, the past page. Okay, guys, I have found that the multiple trace usually takes slightly longer to go through. So let's go through, let's see how quickly we can get through this. Okay, the two main ones that you guys talked about, blades cutting people and rocks getting in your eye, right? Both answers are fine. There's a lot of space to write that. Now, it does say describe. They're looking for two questions. So it's not enough to say sharp, lad, sharp blades. You have to say sharp blades are bad. Right? I'd rather you said sharp blades are bad because they hurt you. Right? Or I said because they cause serious injury. Right? 
that's what I'm giving as a bare minimum for two marks. I'm not saying it's the ideal, I'm saying that's a bare minimum. Okay, again, how do we solve this? Now, it's again, it's an explain. Explain means you have to show cause and effect. You have to say this means this, right? So what we have is we have a metal plate and the metal plate prevents people from touching the blade. Or we have a metal plate that prevents the rocks from getting in people's eyes, right? That's what you need as a bare minimum. I happen to talk about drop forged. You don't have to use that. Okay. This one here says describe, and I told you that it was only worth two marks, right? Describe two marks, two things, really you only actually should be, the question should have said identify, right? But in this case, I did describe them. If I was just going to identify, I would simply have said saves time, noisy, right? Now, because I said two marks, I would only give you half a mark each for that. I'm saying the standard's a little higher. Obviously, they thought that this question was pretty easy to answer. I said... Lawn mowers reduce time and effort required to cut lawns. And I even put in brackets because I didn't want to write too much more than that. I said, why do we want to mow lawns? Well, they make our garden look nice. And also, having a mowed lawn means you don't get snakes. Right? That's, I just put that in brackets. A little bit extra. You know, there's a little bit, a little something, something. They call that in, um, in, Amer in the American self, they call that lagna. Right? It's like a little something on the side. Okay. Um, the negative... There's lots you could use, right? I, um, I told my friend, my, my friend when he looked at this question, this is the first one he said, he's like, what's the downside of having a lawnmower? I'm like, well, they use fossil fuels. Fossil fuels are non-renewable. They cause greenhouse gases. He's like, you know, that's just like a conspiracy, right? You know, like that doesn't really exist. I'm like, don't write that in the HSE, right? So I'm going to urge you not to write that in the HSE. So just something different, a little bit entertaining. We, we, talk, about, we talk about climate change all the time. So I thought I'd go with something else. Noise. Right? A lot of councils, a lot of communities will say that you're not allowed to mow at 10 p.m. Right? If you decide that you like to mow your lawn at 2 o'clock in the morning, your neighbours will get upset. Right? So that's a downside. Okay. <coughs> this question, a little bit tough. Right? The sort of toughness that I expect to see from a trial, right? an independent trial. Okay. So first of all, they said find the reaction. Now, I decided to find the reaction on the rear wheel rear wheels because I wanted to find reaction A, right? So to find reaction A, where do I have to take moments about? I have two unknowns. I don't know A, I don't know B. I've got two unknowns. So, excellent. So if I want to find A, I have to take moments about B. Good work. Okay, so I take some of the moments clockwise about B are zero. Okay, my first force, force is reaction A. Is it going clockwise or anti-clockwise? Okay, so I put my finger on B, and then I spin it. I push in the direction of the arrow at A. Is it turning the circle clockwise or anti-clockwise? Put the pin on, put your finger on B, and then flick in the direction of the arrow at A. Is it going like a clock? Okay, I'm going to do it again. Putting my finger on B. Yeah? It's going clockwise, so it's positive. RA, RA is the force. I always like to write force, brackets, distance. What's the distance? 380 plus 240 in the brackets. I sometimes write 630 above the brackets. I didn't in this case, I should have. Minus, right, because I said if I put my finger on A and then I flick down the direction of weight, I get an anti-clockwise direction. So I'm saying weight is minus 450 times 240, right? When I plug that into the calculator, I get, I'm going to get a reaction of 175. Now, that's not two wheels. That's a bit of a tricky question. There's two wheels. Each force is divided between a wheel, right? So each force is divided by a wheel. So that's 87.5. Right? A lot of people got their wheels mixed up. Right? Don't get your meals, wheels mixed up. That's the sort of thing that if you did as a real engineer, you could actually design the, the columns in the wrong pot, spots and people may or may not die. Right? Hopefully, hopefully they don't. Right? To find the other one, I just did some of the forces vertically. Right? I know that if I've got um, 450 down and I've only got 75 going up, I'm going to need 270 extra up in order to meet it. Again, that's for two wheels. I divide it. 
Now, the last little trick, if you didn't have an arrow showing the direction of your forces, I might have taken off a mark, yeah? Because direction is an important component of getting that question right, yeah? Sometimes the HSC, they tend to be a bit friendlier on this. They tend to like either let you know that you need to show the direction or they don't, right? They'll include the direction for you. Okay, friction. We're finding a coefficient of friction. Harry knows all about this now, right? Coefficient of friction, well, first of all, oh, guys, I'll tell you what, I've, I've got a video for you I made over the holidays. It's pretty good. You're not ready for it yet, right? Not until term two, oh, sorry, term one of next year, you're ready to see my masterpiece. But that kazoo kid, I've got a, I've got a video, right? It's, it's banned from Facebook. It's that good, right? Anyway, force equals mu n, or as Kazoo, Kazoo Kid likes to say, it's fun, 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 right? Now that means that our coefficient of friction is friction over the normal reaction. Yeah, friction over the normal reaction. Our friction. They told us what our friction was. Two, two, five. They, they told us. They didn't tell us what the normal reaction is. But they told us the mass. So if the mass is for, for uh, um, 45 kilos, our what's our weight? 450. Our our weight in in this case, our weight and our normal are the same thing. So two 255 over 450 is 8.5. Bam! Right now we ha we know if you've got a coefficient of friction that's greater than one, something is wrong. It is not possible to have more friction than the force of the weight, right? Friction can never be more than the weight of the object. Yeah, just think of it that way. It also can never be negative. So it has to be between zero and one, okay? Now, I'm telling you the answer here, the minimum answer for you to talk to me about um, tempering. Now, as was pointed out by Darcy, that typically we temper steels that are higher than, a qu content higher than uh, 1%. You, we can temper lower lower contents. We just typically temper higher carbon content steel, right? This is why we talk about how we don't want to weld high carbon steel, because high carbon steel, if we weld it, what happens when we temper? We make what kind of material? It starts with an M. Martensite. Yep, martensite. It's needle-like. It's got a BCT crystal structure. Martensite. Yeah, yeah acicular, right? We don't want to create exodon exodon martensite. But sometimes we do want martensite. What are some things where we want martensite? Yes, but when do we want that? When we want to... Samurai swords. What do samurai swords do? Cut. So whenever we want to have something that cuts, or if we want something that's very, very wear resistant, right? What's the problem? What's the problem with samurai swords? We don't want them to snap. Yeah, we don't want them to snap. We want something to shatter. If their toughness is no good. So the problem is we get hardness, but we sacrifice toughness, right? So what do we have to do to bring back that toughness? We need to, yeah. Our love was lost, but now we found it, right? We have to temper it, right? Okay, so we have to temper it. So here is the bare minimum for you to get two marks. You just need to say heat until you have 100% austenite, or just write heat to austenite range. I chose to write gamma steel because gamma steel, I know I can't misspell, right? Heat till gamma steel, then quench, then temper. Boom. That's the minimum you need to write. You could write that we quench in stuff. What are we quenching? Oil? All oil or brine, yes, yeah, salt water bath, right? Okay, good. What temperature do we what temperature do we temper at? Depends. How long do we temper? Depends. Right? Depends. Okay, the next question. It says, uh, provide reasons why we use cast iron and then draw the structure of cast iron. Well, that's the question there. And here's our answer. Okay, why do we use cast iron? It's good for machining, right? Good dampening effects. Stable at high temperature, good corrosion resistance, good conductivity, right? Me, I always like to talk about it's easy to machine, it's easy to cast, right? They didn't talk about it's easy to cast, right? It's easy to machine, it's easy to cast, and dampening characteristics. So, what, Harry, what does dampening characteristics mean? It means it doesn't vibrate too much. It doesn't wobble, 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 wobble. Instead, it slows down that wobbling, so you don't hear, like, a knocking sound, yeah? 
Okay, how do we draw it? Oh, boy, I did not like how they drew the answers in the exam. Right, they said graphite flakes, um, perlite or ferrite ma matrix. So if I was to draw this again, um, this I'll have to somehow stick on here. Right? When we went on our magical mystery tour, when we went on our cast iron adventure, when we went on our cast iron adventure, we said that we're going to have perlite, we're going to have ferrite, which I just draw the letter alpha because it's fast, and then we're going to have some graphite. Okay, so what we want to imagine, guys, what we want to imagine again, we've got this high carbon content, right? Think of carbon content being like money, right? We've got a society with lots of money, right? And we've got these ferrite, the ferrite people, they're poor, right? They're a little bit feral, the ferrite people, they're poor. We should, in this situation where we have lots of carbon content, we should have perlite, right? Or even cementite, we should actually be in cementite, you know, that's the high carbon, you know, that, that would be if we had even evenly distributed money, we'd have just nothing but cementite. But the graphite guys, they're greedy, and they come and steal all the carbon. And those guys who used to be middle class cementite, they've had all their money taken away, and now they're poor ferrite. Yeah, I don't know if that helps anyone to remember that story, but that's, that's the story I'm running with. Okay. Um... Explain how ABS breaks work. Okay, ABS breaks, what I would write is a computer detects when a wheel is slipping and it applies the brakes in such a way that we can still continue to steer. Right, we have to talk about cause and effect. I was pretty generous when I marked this. I'm going to read out the answer that it actually says on the thing. ABS prevents any wheel from skidding when brakes are applied. A skidding wheel results, results in loss of control by the driver. If the driver has more control when braking, then the driver and passenger safety is enhanced. So by the wheel applying the brake in a dun 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 dun, we don't skid. Or actually, if you, you do hear it sometimes. You'll hear your ABS brakes come on. It goes, right? But if you don't have that, you just imagine you have brakes going, and you can't steer. What's a downside of ABS brakes? They don't work on gravel. Now, I don't know if I told you guys this story, but when I was once driving from Canberra to my job in the country, I dropped off some guy at Canberra Airport and I was driving back home and I started this break because I was going too fast on gravel, right? I was really upset because I took a wrong turn. It was going to be an extra half an hour at least on this four hour drive. Wait, four hour round trip dive, drive. Anyway, I'm really angry so I'm speeding and then I, I, I try and hit the brakes and I'm on gravel and I tell you, I just went back and forth and back and forth between these trees just trying to avoid the trees in a company car no less. But I'm, I'm worried about dying at this point. Like I'm doing, you know, 80. And um, as I'm trying, it just back and forth. So what I had to remember is don't overcompensate. Don't oversteer. And eventually I was able to bring the car back. And, you know, I'm here today to teach you guys about engineering. Okay. Describe Pascal's principle. Oh, okay. Uh, wait. I is, ex oh, okay. The guy who wrote this exam, he's obviously changed the question. It used to say describe Pascal's principle. Now it says outline how disc brakes operate. Two marks, right? They're not talking about explain. They're not saying cause and effect. They're saying outline. Give us an overview. Tell us a story of how these things work. Okay, because I can't look at the answers in the book, I have to give you my, uh, my own answers here. Okay, disc brakes. I always start from the foot on the brake. When the driver applies pressure to the brake, brake fluid is displaced, which goes to the master cylinder, and then goes to each individual brake caliper. The brake calipers, the displacement of, of um, brake fluid causes the brake caliper to press against the disc. The disc, this contact creates friction. Friction converts kinetic energy to heat and then slows down the vehicle. That's my story about how it works. Key points I like to talk about. Use the word brake fluid. Use the word friction. Right? They're the two words you must say, otherwise I'm going to take off a mark. Right? Then I would like, I really like it when people talk about kinetic energy to heat. I really like that. The other thing I'd suggest is a good idea to talk about is you can talk about how brake fluid can't be compressed. Now you noticed I didn't say that. I'm not going to take a mark off for it. But I think it's a good idea to remember that brake fluid, we deliberately use brake fluid because it can't be compressed. There's no air bubbles or anything for it to squish. If it was compressible, 
it would mean that we'd have a little bit of uh, mushiness in our brakes, which we don't like. It means we'd have a bit of, we'd have to do extra work before we actually started getting braking. Okay, question two, calculate the force on the brakes. Okay, so calculate the force on the disc pad if the force on the master cylinder is 400. Okay, so for that to work, we have to apply Pascal's principle. What's the difference in size between our two objects, between our two diameters? Our first diameter is 75, our, our, sorry, our big diameter is 75, our little diameter is 40. So what's our difference? 7.5 divided by 4 is 1.87, right? What we need to do is we need to have that number squared equals 3.5. That means that the force that leaves the wheel cylinder is going to be 3.5 times bigger. Remember, we always take the diameter, we square it, and that's our increase in force, right? So if we applied the input force on the master cylinder is 400. 400 times 3.5 is going to be... 400 times 3.5 is 14.06. Okay. The answers in the book, they do it properly. They actually find the area. Big area, big force, right? Pascal's principle means that the pressure on this side has to be the same as the pressure on that side, right? So if there's big area, big force. That's what we need to keep the pressure aside. I use a shortcut. I just say, what's the difference in the two diameters? Square it. Yeah, and that saves me time and effort. It could save you time and effort if you wanted. Okay, the next one, we've got a sketch. Okay, we've got this nice sketch here. This sketch looks a lot like the one from the HSC trial that I gave to my year 12s. I'm pretty sure I sat in and I showed you guys this sketch, right? Now the one in the, the HSC did was a little bit tougher. The one in the HSC it had a thread, right? Which we haven't learned about threads yet, so we, I didn't make you have to do threads. But my God, I thought it was a good question. I really talked about how much I like this question. Let's see what the answer looks like. Okay, so the answer, things that you need to have. You need to show your center lines. And now you can see my, my answers here are a little bit warped. My scanner, the scanner in the staff room, I always complain about it, but I keep spurning me again and again, and I keep going back. I'm like a... You know, like a, someone who doesn't learn, you know, like the, the I'm not going to go into the white ribbon component of today's topic. Um, <coughs> um, like Eminem and Rihanna. Anyway, uh, okay, so first thing, you need to show, you need to show your center lines, right? Not showing center lines is going to lose you a mark. Four marks, you lose a mark for not showing center lines. You need to draw your sectioning. Not drawing a sectioning, going to lose you a mark. Now, I would say the sectioning should be slightly thinner. Now, it can be very hard to draw thin with a pencil, so I just draw a little bit lighter. And if I press a little bit lighter, it will also be thinner. I want to see a difference in line quality between your center lines, your sectioning lines, and the rest of your drawing. Your, the rest of your drawing should be thick and dark. Those other lines, the center lines and your sectioning lines, should be light. Okay, I'll give you a mark for being generally correct in your shape and I'll be a, give you a mark for having generally good line work, which means that you didn't feather your lines. It means that your lines more or less lined up, look like you used a ruler. That's where I gave four marks to. Okay, moving along, what do we got next? Okay, describe one cost and one benefit of biomedical engineering. Okay, this was an interesting question. Um, oh, sorry, we're back here. This is an interesting question. One cost and one benefit of biomedical engineering. Okay. They said again they want to describe. I really think they want to identify. It just means don't describe too much. A cost, that to be paid for. Advances in biomedical engineering can be expensive. This needs to be funded by either the government or private investment. That's, that's a cost. Benefit, biomedical engineering improves, extends life and improves quality of life. This allows people to live happier and more productive lives. That's my answer. Let's have a look at the answers that they said. Answers could include benefits. People regain functions, increase in, longe in longevity, usually result in happier people. Healthier people are less of a drain on public welfare and finances. Development of innovative technology that may be used elsewhere, um, employer of many people. Right, so it employs people. 
It could also be good for our national economy. If like things like cochlea have made a lot of money, right? They've made a lot of money for our, our, our revenue. Costs. Risks can result in catastrophic outcomes for patients, right? Uh, I'll come back to that. Cultural resistance, playing God. Animals may be used um, that people may object to. Okay, well, let's talk about those, each of those a little bit. Catastrophic outcomes, right? There's situations where people have been given mega dosages, like they've gone to get a regular x-ray and they've been given a mega dosage of radiation and the person's died of cancer six weeks later, right? I broke my hand and you've killed me, right? That could be bad, right? So we have to be careful. Right, in the development of these technologies, often people, we, we can end up spending a lot of money for people who don't live very much longer. Right, the first guy who got an artificial heart implant, he lived for six weeks. Right, there's also big problems, right, like a certain father-in-law who may or may not have uh, six, sorry, six days, but maybe not six days, maybe let's say two weeks before he, uh, he died, he died of terminal cancer, he got a $20,000 hip replacement. 1% of all patients use 20% of all medical expenses. 20% of all patients use 80%. So if we had $100 to spend on medicine, one guy, right, and 100 people, one guy takes $20, right? The next 20 guys take $80, right? The remaining 80 people, they all have to share $20, right? They get 50, well, it's, it's not many cents each, right? Okay. Um, playing God, right? This is not so much biomedical engineering. This is more genetic, genetic engineering. Genetic engineering, we have these great things we can do, right? We have these things like um, stem cell research. But let's keep it in, 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 in biomedical engineering, right? We have ultrasound tests that can tell whether or not someone's going to have Down syndrome, right? Iceland has zero babies with, with Down syndrome born. Why? Because they all get the test, and when they get the test and they find out the kid's got Down syndrome, they don't have the baby. That's humans who aren't getting born. Now, I've known people who have had kids with Down syndrome, and even the best kids, it really, it just changes your entire life, right? I, I, can, I, can, see, I, I, can, I can see how people support that decision. I'm not going to say on record where my stand is, but I can very much understand where Iceland's position, right? There are people who feel as though this is an abomination, especially religious people tend to feel as though this is a big problem. Okay, animals, right? No one likes the idea of testing on animals, but pretty much all re research, right? All medical research, there's a, a lab rat involved, right? Well, a lot of people who go into science don't appreciate that you're gonna have to kill a lot of rats, right? And it takes a bit of getting used to, right? Whenever, a lot of my friends are in science, and whenever I meet them, like, so how many rats did you kill this week? And they're like, they give me like the slanting eye look and like, what do you know about? I'm like, oh no, all my friends are in science, like 15. 15 is how many rats I killed this week. Right? <laughs> what's the story of the people bleeding through the eye or something? Yeah, yeah. Often, often you have to take bleeds through the eye because retinal bleeds give you the best results and it blinds the rat. So not only do, and then you, then you wait a couple of weeks till you do your test again, then blind them in the other eye and then you kill them. But a lot of people resist that. And I've talked about my friend who developed an allergy to, to, to mice and rats during the course of his, uh, his time working in science, and now he can't work with them anymore. And all my other friends are like, that's totally psychosomatic. Like, that's totally because he just can't deal with killing the mice. Um, okay. Things they don't tell you when you do biology. Okay. Digital electronics may be used in many biomedical innovations. Okay. There's just so many. So many. MRI scanners, cochlea, um, pacemakers, digital monitor monitoring systems, right? Did I talk about ultrasounds, uh, bionic limbs, right? These days we've got bionic limbs that can move based on uh, brainwave function, right? Wheelchair, motorized wheelchairs, some great answers there. Okay. Uh, that's identify, right? So it's a pretty easy, easy one mark. Explain the purpose of truth tables. Truth tables are what we use for logic gates. It's where we say that if two inputs on an AND gate, right, AND gate, they both need to be true in order for the AND gate to be true. Right, they're in the book. We've definitely talked about them, right? Uh, I do remember some frustration when we were doing the exam. Okay. Uh, I'm just going to read the answer. 
Truth tables are tables describing the outputs from logic gate circuits for all possible combinations, with zero equaling false or low, meaning no, in it, no electricity, and one equaling true or high. Okay, what's an IC? An IC, an integrated circuit. Some people said an IC is an integrated a circuit that is integrated. Zero marks, right? An IC is a a microscopic array of electronic components placed in a chip or a wafer, a semiconductor. Here's what I would have said, right? That's a good answer, right? If you want to read that answer, it's a good answer. I would have said that it is a silicon chip with program that is already programmed, encased in a protective coating. That's what I would have said. Examples include 555 timers, right? That's what I would have said. Yeah? Yeah? They don't ask for too much. I'm looking for a chip that is programmed, pre-programmed, and protected. That's And if you give me an example, I'm going to be happy. I'm going to be more tolerant of something that's less good. Right? Their answer is obviously the gold standard. Okay, I didn't use this question 13, uh, 23. I used this one. Why? Because I felt that we talked so much about three-fourths method that I had to cover it. And I want to cover it now rather than really forcing it down your throat in uh, the HSC. Okay, so I'm going to describe this like someone who can't see the board. Uh, or who's looking at a picture rather than me drawing it up. Okay, first of all, step one, and step one, I extend my two lines up until I find my, my point of concurrency, right? My first engineering class, they started OMG, POC, right? So, um, oh my God, it's, point, it's concurrent, right? We find where they're concurrent. If there's three forces and they're in equilibrium and they're not parallel, they must all meet at the same point, which we call the POC, right? That means our reaction A also goes through POC. So that blue dotted line, right, that blue dashed line, has to join the point of concurrency and the pin A. <coughs> Once I have that, the third thing I do is I have to choose a scale. I'm going to use a graphical solution here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, what's the one force I know? I know that force F. Right, no, so I know that I have a two kilonewton force. I'm going to use newtons because we should always use base newtons. 2,000 newtons. I'm going to say that 2,000 newtons, let's say it use a scale of 2,000 newtons equals 100 millimeters. Right? Then I need to draw, I have to complete my vector triangle. Right? I complete my vector triangle by drawing a line parallel to that blue line. And so where I had the blue long dash, I then redraw the line parallel that completes the triangle, and I have now my blue small dash. I'm going to zoom in. Oh. I'm going to zoom in. Right? So now I've got my vector triangle. I know this one has to be going up, that one has to be going down, this one has to be going to continue the same direction. They all have to be going the same direction. Okay. Um, if you guys have just got a minute, if you can hold on, uh, I've got one more question before we go. Okay, the last question is, an, okay, so I think that question, once we've applied the scale, we can just use a protractor to find our angle. Now, the great thing about using graphical solution is you can say angle as shown. Yeah, that's how you get that fourth mark. You have to show the angle. Now, you can go. Okay, last question. Isometric drawings. Now, I have a theory that they're phasing out isometric drawings. There was no isometric drawing in the 2016 paper. There was only a little one in 2015, a little one in 2014. And my theory is there'll be another one this year, and there probably won't be one when you guys do the HSC. Right? So in two weeks' time, I think that my year 12 class will get one. And I think my, that's my theory. But we can't afford to ignore them. Now, what I would suggest, it's really worthwhile to have an isometric drawing template. Right? $10, it's worth four marks in your HSC. Right? When you consider that people pay $50 an hour for tutoring, that $10 is, is money well spent, in my, my opinion. Right. What am I looking for four marks? For four marks, yeah? How come the question says do not dimension? How about dimension for the question you asked? That means your drawings were not the correct dimensions. Your drawing was the wrong shape. That's... The eat yours was not the right scale. Yeah? If you want to discuss it in greater depth, that's what I mean when I say dimension. I'm not saying do not dimension. I'm saying yours was the wrong dimensions. You, you drew it the wrong size. Yeah? Okay. So if you want to check it, we can check it. Now, things I'm looking for. I'm looking for general shape. 
I'm looking for a difference between your construction lines and your finished lines. I need to be able to see a difference, right? I'm looking for the general shape. I'm looking for line quality, right? Did you use a ruler, right? So uh, I'm happy to discuss any of these marks if people want to go over it. Okay, on that note, I'm going to hit stop. Wait, wait, wait.